free of cost to MIT for, for doing this. I think it's a very, very good idea. Um, I, I think that, well, first of all, generally, you know, the price agreement is not a completely new agreement. I think there's been a lot of uh, misunderstanding that we have no climate agreement, no legally binding commitments for climate action until the Paris Agreement. Uh, I think that's very wrong. Uh, actually, we have the mother convention, the, the Legally Binding Treaty of 1992, but many of you are familiar with that. And I think the training that you all have been doing is so important to sort of put in context that we have a very, actually, ambitious and equitable and fair Legally Binding Treaty since 1992, okay? Because back then, the awareness of climate impact and climate change was very, very high. It was very high on the political agenda of all countries. Many of you were not born yet at that time. Uh, that's why you think that nothing existed, you know, uh, but it was that. The problem is, in the last 25 years, the implementation of that agreement has been a disaster, okay? Because that agreement recognized historical responsibility of what today is the OECD world, the developed countries. That they have taken up most of the carbon space, the atmospheric space, and therefore they have to do more. Because in the process of polluting and eating up the, uh, the atmosphere, they've become very rich and very developed, so they have capacity and resources and technological potential. That is the situation that we had 25 years ago. So it wasn't that developing countries had no obligation to do anything. Our obligation was to not follow the same pathway, but to go sustainable. We also failed, all right? Now, of course, a lot of it has to do with the failure in the developed countries of doing the fundamental shift, the power shift. Not just power shift, but energy, urbanization, agriculture. I think too much attention is put on just energy. It's not just about energy and technology, it's about our entire way of life, our consumption, how we do and deal with forests and land and agriculture. So, so they didn't do that fundamental shift. They also failed to provide the means of implementation, the financial resources, the clean technology, to the developing countries. Developing countries follow the same pathway. I don't say that we didn't do anything. We did, but not enough. So we basically followed the same pathway. So 25 years forward, we are in a situation where the agreement uh, has not been implemented fully, right? Now, of course, for many countries feeling the impact of climate change, they have no choice. When a hurricane hits you, when extreme weather hits you, like drought or what have you, the countries, mostly developing countries, they have to spend money, divert from other you know, uh, spending because they have no choice. And we know uh, climate hazards can actually wipe out a lot of the good things that happen in the country. So what actually uh, really at stake in the road so-called to Paris was because back in Copenhagen in 2009, a bunch of developed countries, basically led by uh, you know the, uh, the U.S. and Japan and Canada and Australia, they just felt that well you know we don't like it because we can't do all that. We don't like the equitable framework, so we want to change the rules. So the fight has been to change the rules, and in the name of saying that the world has changed, today China is the biggest polluter. So why should China do less than America? Well, I've lived in China for 10 years. I'm not defending China's uh, pollution, because that's why I'm home for the six months. I can't live in China. But it's 1.4 billion people, or 1.3, not 1.4 yet. And they have huge poverty still. So this tension between growth, uh, uh, and the right kind of growth and pollution, and what kind of fuel to use, is not easy. So for me, I think it's important for us to realize the Climate Change Convention was never just about environment. It's about what kind of development vision we want to have, what kind of technology we want to choose to have. And this is a very challenging development challenge, right? So if you look from the science point of view, the science agrees that two degrees, even keeping at two degrees uh, rise from pre-industrial level is not enough, right? But that, at least that is what politically has been agreed by all countries. So we all agree that two degrees is the minimum. We should go even below that. It's been for a few years there. But the, not only the small islands, the AOCs, the allies, the small islands, it's not only them, but the least developed countries, the Africa group, Africa group, a group of very sort of uh, radical, progressive groups uh, of countries in uh, South America, the Alba country, Venezuela, Ecuador, uh, Nicaragua, you know, about 10, 12 countries. So it was a very large group of countries which wanted to put 1.5, uh, you know, a degree uh, sort of temperature rise into the agreement, all right? But not just to put 1.5, because 1.5 means we have to do massive, massive actions, right? We have to change entirely the planet's way of developing and being. How are we going to do that? I'm not talking about technology and solutions. How to share in a fair and equitable way the responsibility of those actions. And that's why one of the biggest fights was to keep the principle of the UN 
common but differentiated responsibilities. That we all have to act, but we all have to do different levels. And you can do as much as you can, but some have to take the lead to do more. This was what was trying to be dismantled by a whole bunch of developed countries. All right? And so the Paris Agreement was about reaffirming equity as a framework, reaffirming ambition because the science tells us we must do so. All right? Now, a lot of the publicity talked about the United States championing the coalition of ambition. But in the closed door rooms, you will hear things like, I mean, we couldn't get into the rooms. I mean, Malaysia and all the developing countries did not manage to persuade five or six other developed countries to let us back into the rooms of the, of the actual negotiations. But we were talking to many different negotiators. All right? The United States said, we understand why 1.5 is important. President Obama met with a few heads of states from the small islands. And they all went there the first week. We understand why you're concerned. I also, I'm paraphrasing, I wasn't in the room, but this is you know, more or less what happened. I, Obama, believe in climate change. And you're right, this president is trying to do more in the last one year before he leaves office, right? But the small analysts were told, you understand your concern? Others were told, we understand your concern, but we cannot take anything back to Washington that is legally binding on mitigation, that is legally binding on financial commitment for the world, all right? That's why in the Paris Agreement, for mitigation of developed countries, the world is not shall take action across the whole economy, but should. That was the typo that Nicaragua was saying the last minute, you cannot allow that typo to go through. Malaysia and many countries fought, but the French presidency in the last six hours said, if we don't give in to the United States to change shall to should to mitigation, then we will not have a Paris Agreement. So one of the biggest setbacks for me, for the Paris Agreement, is that in the UNFCCC, the obligation is legally binding. All developed countries must and shall take mitigation action across the entire economy. All right? Today, it should. And developing countries are now, in return for getting all these developed countries on board, developing countries, and I think at the national level, is good. We should now take mitigation actions. We also have to, in Malaysia, for example. And in, over time, we should also think across the whole economy. It's a huge, huge commitment. I mean, it's really not, I mean, if you're going to do it, it's very serious work, okay? So 1.5 in the end, what we see in the treaty is what? Pursue efforts to limit. Pursue efforts to limit 1.5. So you see the number 1.5 is quite weak, but it's okay, 1.5 is there. The issue is how to share the responsibility. Now, I think the biggest success we have for the Paris Agreement is we kept the common but differentiated responsibility and equity principle. It's more in the treaty, you operationalize it. So the work is now in the next years, how to really work towards 1.5. But you can only do it if there's equity internationally. You cannot expect Fiji and Samoa and even Malaysia to carry the burden, all right? But how do we do it fairly? So the fight will continue as to how to do it fairly. But meanwhile, I'm very worried because President Obama's uh, presidential regulation to reduce emissions from power plants has been halted by the Supreme Court because 26, 27 state governments have said this is not your business, it's against the Constitution. So, so the fight is in every country. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, it's the reverse is true. I, I think that developing countries and Malaysia play a very key role at the negotiation level. Over the last four or five years, have actually uh, gotten its act together. I, I think we realized that, as we were discovering early on, you know, the, the imbalance in power, as you put it, between the negotiating and the bloc. Uh, that has actually changed in the last four or five years. Uh, the like-minded developing countries of about 30-something countries includes uh, China, India, uh, Egypt, uh, the Alba group from South America, you know, Venezuela, Argentina, uh, then we have Malaysia, we have Pakistan. We're talking about uh, countries that have something like communist up to something like 60, 70 percent of the world's population uh, feels the most impact in terms of climate change. So, and India, you know, I mean, these are this is some really amazing, and even small ones like Dominica, which is this tiny island in the, in the Caribbean, you know. So, this this was uh, in Mali uh, and Sudan. Uh, uh, then there was also, I think, uh, Iran, um, yeah. Vietnam. So, so, so this this uh, light micro developing group countries was still part of G7. But because they got together and they really raised the, the, the level of what would be acceptable or not acceptable. So when you have a whole bunch of countries that come together, then you are, you are stronger. And I think it is that unity and that sort of uh, persistence on principle, right? 
that we now have a Paris Agreement that covers all mitigation, adaptation, technology, finance, because what developed countries wanted out of a Paris Agreement was to focus only on mitigation and to shift the mitigation burden more to developing countries, especially the middle income, bigger developing countries. They were willing to give a little bit of exception to small islands and these developed countries, but the idea was to draw most of the developing countries, including Malaysia, Philippines, others, uh, into, into having the same level of responsibility uh, internationally as the developed countries. And when you agree to something that's unfair, it does, now I'm saying when we come home, we always must do more, okay? I'm, I'm separating this a little bit from the international, uh, why international fairness is important, because globally we have to do a lot of things together. If, for everything that developing countries do, if, if the bulk of the developed countries don't do their part, we also won't get there. So, so I would not, I, compromises, yes, there were a lot of compromises, but I think we also have what we call red lines that many developing countries had. And one of the biggest red lines was we will not give up the principle of equity, common beneficial responsibility. We will reaffirm that historical responsibility is part of the, of the, of the deal. We will have a, an agreement that will cover all the different aspects of climate action. We have that. And we also have an additional thing that is not in the original convention. Loss and damage. Beyond a certain point, we cannot adapt. It's permanent loss and damage. Okay, Your, your soils are so saline that you can't grow things anymore. Uh, your coral reefs disappear forever. So loss and damage after a lot of fight is now recognized as a separate pillar of action, of climate action. Now, it was a high price to pay because uh, the, the small islands wanted 1.5, somewhere at the number 1.5, and in return for that, they had to accept something that the rest of the, most of the rest of the world did not want to accept, the developing countries, which is that you have a provision in the Paris Agreement that says you will not use uh, the fact that loss and damage is recognized as a pillar of climate uh, concern, you cannot use that as a basis for liability and compensation. Okay? Uh, this is what it says in the decision uh, of, of, the, of the, the cave of the agreement. But of course, uh, we will fight that out. You cannot use that, you cannot, let's say, in, in other words, you cannot go to a court and say, because of Paris Agreement Article XXX for loss and damage, I want to sue, let's say, a company or the United States government or something like that, right? But it doesn't mean that loss and damage is not entitled for financial support. So, so, so we want to find out what, what, uh, what is still available. But it was a high price to pay because the concept of liability, right? If you're a small uh, country or vulnerable country, it was very, very hardly fought for. And that was given up by a very closed door meeting of the EU, the United States, and some small islands. Nobody else knew about it. And then you just, in the last minute, you sort of say, do you want to drag the whole thing down and collapse it? It's a lot of pressure on, on that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, so, uh, so I would say it's not that uh, there were some compromises, and then some of the compromises were not collective, but in the end, I think on the whole, we got a better deal than we expected. That is not to say we should be saying we are happy with it. We need to do a lot more to make sure that in the implementation, we get back the best. Uh, final question to you. I, I, well, you mentioned earlier about how you know a change of word uh, from uh, from yeah. shall to should uh, change the whole meaning, the whole responsibility that countries uh, should do uh, for climate change. Um, I wonder um, how. I mean, are developing countries happy with the whole agreement? Do you think it's beneficial for them at the end of the day? I think you have to do your climate change survey to find out. <laughs> but it depends on who you ask for. I think there are those who say that we have lost some things compared to the original convention. Yeah, and we have. We have also gained more detail in terms of operationalizing equity, for example. But in the end, you know what? Words are words. All right? I think we've lost like this shell for developed countries. It means that you know now it's all voluntary in a way, you know, for mitigation for everybody. Uh, but I don't think that we want to be bogged down by that. I think in the end, it's the pressure that we're going to put in every country on our politicians and our policy makers. Uh, I think we, 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 we will always use ambiguous, because in the end, when you compromise your things which are not clear here and there, then you're going to use that ambiguity uh, to try and get the best. But ultimately, I think we have a framework that we can all work with in different ways, and I think we need to really capitalize on that. But I, I want to emphasize it is not an environmental agreement. It's a sustainable development uh, challenge, right? And very quickly, lastly, and the other thing is, as we are doing our training and educating ourselves, don't look only at the Paris Agreement and all that. Look at the totality. I want to quickly share with you, on Wednesday, this week, all right, 
the World Trade Organization has made a ruling in a panel because um, uh, India, the Indian government, was taken uh, by the United States government to a WTO dispute, right? Because the Indian government has this uh, national solar mission. Very important because they went from zero solar uh, energy to really the, one of the most rapidly increasing solar energy countries in the world. But one of the things that the Indian government requires is that if you are supplying solar panels, etc., to Indian uh, generator for power, part of your contract requires what they call domestic content. All right? This is quite common. Malaysia used to do that as well. In other words, you not everything must be imported 100% because India also produces solar panels and power, etc., etc. So it is a national policy to create employment, to create industrial development in your country, transfer technology, and you're not just buying you know, expensive technology all the time. So this is called domestic content. This was challenged all right, as, a, as an un, un, uh, illegal subsidy. All right, so it's gone in the, to, for the last uh, 12 months, it's been uh, for hearings in the WTO panel. And on Wednesday, the ruling came out that India is in violation of two, at least two agreements of the WTO. Now, this solar mission of India, this whole policy, is part of India's submission to the UNFCCC as their national contribution to bring down emissions and to move towards renewable. Right? Now, so these trade rules are anti-climate change, they're anti-sustainable development. Those rules have to be changed, but right now they're more powerful. Right? So, and then we have uh, cases like, uh, like our Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the TPP, which is very controversial in Malaysia at the moment, all right, there are many, many provisions there that will not allow us to take the kind of action that will need that will be needed for climate transformation. And if you take actions that affect the profits of big companies or even expected potential profit, they haven't made anything yet, they can sue the government for compensation. Quick example, the Obama administration has been sued by a Canadian company because they cancelled their pipeline project right, from, from, from Canada to the US for billions of dollars. This is not a court. This are uh, private arbitrators, a tribunal from lawyers from very, very small mafia from, from, from <laughs> mostly US, uh, North America, and, and Europe, and I mean mafia. One day they are prosecuting, next day they are final arbitration. No accountability, no review, no appeal. Okay? And most of the cases are in favor of the big company. So we have to fight the TPP as well if you want to make your price agreement. Be real.